Hi everyone, thank you for coming to the first talk of the term, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Uh, Peter Thompson, uh, who is the Chief Executive of Human Specialization and Embryology Authority, um, which is responsible for uh, regulation um, of assisted reproductive, reproductive technologies, such as IVF, and licensing of uh, research in human embryos. So please, uh, let's all give a round of applause. Thanks very much. Delighted to be here. We're, we're a small select band, but let's, uh, let's go with that. Um, yeah, a few of you of my kind of age. So for those of you of my kind of age, um, a very famous French film director called Jean-Luc Godard, most of you that may be a very distant name these days, he very famously said, a story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and not necessarily in that order. So... Um, Following Godard, um, I'm going to slightly jump cut around a bit today um, and not tell you a kind of linear story. So I'm going to begin at the end. I'm then going to go back to the origins of IVF. I'm going to talk a bit about the kind of institutional origins of the HFEA itself. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about innovation in the context of one particular innovation in this field around mitochondrial donation. Um, I'm then going to do a bit of looking ahead to have uh, a bit of a conversation around gene editing. And then I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and use it to wind up to talk about regulation and innovation. So uh, I'm going to jump around a bit. And throughout what I'm trying to do here is trying to think about science and public policy making and the extent to which in, you know, if you would like, in a modern society where we decide not just what's scientifically possible but what's legitimate is a sort of debated question. So that's the sort of idea I'm going to be playing around with today. So, um, to start at the end, as God I would have said, um, when we think about the idea of regulation and innovation, it seems to me we're playing with two things that seem in tension. They don't seem like obvious bedfellows, do they? There's a sort of view of innovation, and you might almost call it a sort of neoliberal view of innovation, which is that it flourishes in the absence of rules. Let people just get on with it and they will be more innovative. And that somehow regulation and it feels like a series of rules or constraints, and that somehow or other they must inevitably be in tension with the idea of innovation. My sense is that I think in modern economies, and often in quite developed, sophisticated sectors of modern economies, like pharmaceuticals, that sort of dichotomy between regulation and innovation is just misplaced. Um, and in fact, many of the most innovative sectors of the UK economy are actually its most regulated. There seems to be no neat fit between absence of rules, existence of innovation. Now that's not to say that regulation per se and rules are automatically good for innovation. Because clearly one can imagine a set of regulatory rules so onerous or ridiculous or prescriptive it would be extraordinarily difficult to innovate. But it does suggest to me that uh, good regulatory rules might actually assist innovation. And certainly the UK government uh, thinks that in its uh, life sciences strategy, for example, it says that one of the very strengths of life sciences in this country, and we are good at it, it's one of the sectors we're, we're still good at, is actually precisely because of the, the the level of regulation in the field as a whole. I don't just mean the HFEA in particular, but the NHRA and there's a number of other people in the field. So there's a sense that actually the presence of regulation might actually be, be good for innovation more generally. And it seems to me that that association yeah. might be particularly persuasive in areas where actually um, the work itself is of a contested nature. Because in much of science and innovation, there's a kind of sense in which there is not a, an agreement out there in the wider world that this particular thing is a universal good. 
Some people think these, these you know, certain innovations might be extraordinarily beneficial, and some people are extremely wary about them. And in an atmosphere where public trust is not a given, and it may well be that regulation is particularly helpful. And I've tried to express this on this slide in a sort of crude formulaic way by suggesting that rules plus trust might equal innovation. And obviously I don't mean any old rules, and I try and quantify this here, but I'm, I'm talking here whether or not there may well be the opportunity to establish a kind of virtuous, virtuous circle, as I suggest, where well-designed regulatory rules in turn create greater public trust, which create the conditions in which regulation, uh, in which innovation is more possible. I remember talking to a scientist, an American scientist in this country who said, if I was doing the work I was doing in America, I'd have to worry about whether or not it was privately funded or federally funded, which might mean I had literally two sets of, uh, of equipment. There'd probably be people with placards outside my laboratory and possibly guns. Alternatively, I can have your blokes with clipboards. Um, you know, so it may well be that well-designed regulatory rules actually help with public trust, which then help create the conditions to innovate. We'll return to that a bit later on. So, um, having started from the end, let me go back to the beginning. Uh, there are a few of us in the room who may well be old enough to remember this. In 1978, Louise Brown was born. Uh, that's from the Daily Mail, the next day, the lovely Louise. And there she is on her 40th birthday. Um, she's the first so-called test tube baby. She was born in Oldham General Hospital in 1978, July, I think. Doesn't really matter. But... The fact she was born in Oldham General Hospital is of more than uh, narrow interest because she wasn't born in a great teaching hospital. And if you go back to the archive, much of the medical establishment at the time thought that IVF was a very dangerous and unwise thing to try out. An awful lot of the big funders wouldn't touch it. And for every, every headline that said the lovely Louise, there were all sorts of headlines around this was a retrograde step, it was dangerous, it was playing God, and a whole stack of things. People worried about the health of the children born and so on. So, um, you know, something, and this was genuinely extraordinary at the time, this was proper sort of man on the moon kind of stuff. And if you do a proper uh, media search at the time, you'd be staggered how many front pages across the world. This was genuine world front page news. World's first test tube baby. Um, and as I say, and it was, much of it was contested, much of it was critical, and, you know, it seems odd now, in a way. Um, as I say, she's 40, healthy, has children, they are healthy, um, I met her once, it's, and this is no criticism at all, she is the personification of ordinariness. Her birth is extraordinary, and her life and her being is perfectly ordinary. She's a lovely, very ordinary woman, just like, you know, some relative time or something like that. The, the, you know, the circumstance of her being is extraordinary, but she has led the most ordinary of lives, and that's not a criticism. And in a way, there's something sort of perfect about that balance. Because if you then move on, that very ordinary birth, which took a lot of goes to get there, um, has actually had an aggregate change of really some significance. Not just many new families, new opportunities to have biological families, and a whole bunch, bunch of challenges. So, 1978, Louise Brown was born. We've no idea how many people there are in the world who've been uh, born by IVF, assisted reproduction more generally. It's well over 5 million. That's partly because many of these births take place in the world where there's no, no means of counting. But there's an awful lot of people born on IVF. But not only that, as it, not as it helped heterosexual couples who are having pro fertility problems to have biological children, it's also enabled 
many families who had no prospect whatsoever, not because of fertility reasons, to have biologically related children. So of course, many same-sex couples now use IVF as a means of having a biologically related child. It's enabled many families to avoid passing on some really nasty, serious inherited illnesses. Um, usually that's done through a technique called pre pre-implantation genetic diagnosis as a form of embryo selection. And uh, effectively what's happening there is where you have single gene defects that are inherited, you can create embryos in vitro, look at that embryo under a microscope or test for it in something more sophisticated and work out which embryos are affected and which not. The affected ones are discarded and the unaffected ones put back. And that takes out of the family line some very nasty, serious inherited illnesses like Huntington's disease, the BRCA, um, um, breast cancer genes and the like. And in the UK, that's been allowable for a very long time. We license it. And to give you an indication of where testing technology is going, because it's developing very rapidly, we license over 500 serious illnesses for PGD in this country. And, that, and these days, we are licensing them at a rate of about 50 new conditions a year. They're vanishingly rare in many cases. You know, if you didn't have somebody with sort of a family history, you probably wouldn't know them. We've long since done the ones you would have heard of, sort of thing. But as testing increases in speed and accuracy, this is an extraordinary growth area. And you can well imagine, looking ahead, as many more people start to find out there, you know, if you do 23andMe and those online matching services, many more people will know something, not just about their relatives, but about the DNA of their relatives, and people may start making active choices to make these sorts of, take avail of themselves of these sorts of services before having children. So you've got really radical shifts in that sense. And of course, uh, you know, in the future, ART may allow people to actually alter their genetic inheritance. And we may return a bit later on to that particular case in China in 2019, in which the uh, Scientist has recently actually had a jail sentence in which he created twins uh, who uh, effectively had a sort of an immunization against. Um, it's gone, it's middle aged men with us. Um, it'll come back to me. Uh, at least somebody else recommends it's middle aged men with us too. Um, but, you know, these sorts of things are clearly on the horizon. And uh, it's one of the things I'll turn to. But, and this is a big part of what I want to say today. Um, there's nothing necessarily very inevitable about this. Um, although these may be scientific possibilities, they are about the choices that societies want to make. And what's striking about them is the way in which different societies are making very different choices on the basis of their religious basis, or their history, or their culture, and so on. And often societies, which in many other respects seem to be making very similar choices, are in this field actually making quite distinct ones. So the kinds of debates we have in this country around some of this uh, do not take place in Germany, which in many respects is very, very similar to this country, and do not take place precisely because of you know, the history of the Second World War and experimentation colours these kind of debates enormously. So, anyway, I'll return to some of that, but let me say a little bit about uh, the HFBA, uh, and I want to talk a bit about sort of institutional history and how we got here. So, a bit of a political timeline. Louise Brown, as I said, was born in 1978. Four years later, the government established the Warnock Committee, named after its chair, to consider the issues that arose from the birth of Lewis Brown and other testing cases. Um, this is a classic, so for a classic device of British government over the years, the difficult problems, has been to give its wing it to an expert committee. 
Sometimes it does so because it really wants to find a solution, and sometimes it is a useful way to kick something into the long grass and kind of hope it goes away. The Warnock Committee is one of those committees that gives an expert committee a good name. Um, it was, in retrospect, an extraordinary achievement. Nobody, really, across the world had given serious thought to how might one might think about the issues that are thrown up by six degree production, and Mary Warnock, an Oxford philosopher, and what died recently, uh, a great sort of public intellectual in the best sense of the word, chaired a committee made up of a whole range of people, some with a medical scientific background, some with a religious background, some with a lay background, all sorts of persuasions. Her report met over two years, report issued in 1984. Um, it's an extraordinarily impressive achievement. It's impressive in the sense that you've managed to corral all that lot into some kind of consensus, which is no mean feat. It's also an elegant, uh, it's a rare example of its breed. Most of these things are deadly dull, written by committees. Warnock could really write. There's something really very impressive here. So uh, in 1984, she reports. The government then of the day issued things like white papers and consulted. But within six years, <coughs> the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act 1990 was on the statute books. The first act of its kind in the world, and that sets up the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, the organisation of the Chinese company, which she's executive. It gets going in 1991. As it said there, the HFPA is the first regulatory body of its kind in the world, uh, overseeing, as Philip said, um, assisted reproduction and research. And it comes at a time well when actually there weren't a lot of regulatory bodies full stop. So these days in medicine alone and healthcare, there's a whole raft of regulators, the Care Quality Commission and all the rest of it. This predates all of this. Up until this period, um, the regulation of healthcare was largely done by doctors themselves. It was a matter of professional regulation. And indeed the history of regulation generally is a movement from you know, professions looking after their own into wider, usually state or statute uh, re regulation. And the HFPA is a very first, is, 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 you know, the first body of its kind in the world. Um, so all of that happens pretty quickly, but the Act itself uh, was last updated in 2008. So we get an Act in 1990, and we update it in 2008, and it hasn't been updated since. And in an area of quite fast-moving clinical practice and science. That's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? So what we've got here is a cutting-edge area of medicine with considerable societal concern, and we decide to regulate by putting a sort of frame, a legal framework around it. The medicine then careers off at quite a speed, but we decide to revisit that regulation 18 years later, and we've still not done it another 12 years, but revisit it again another 12 years. And what that tells you about is the difficulty of parliamentary approval for something like this. This is still contested territory. And to reopen the Act brings into play all sorts of things that are difficult. The general convention in UK parliamentary uh, practice that matters of conscience are subject to free votes rather than party votes, you know, party whipping. So that makes just getting legislation through parliament tricky. And it opens up a whole bundle of questions that successive governments or different political persuasions have often uh, you know, wanted to keep uh, quite closely under wraps. So it's difficult stuff. But what's striking about Warnock, actually, is the extent to which that report sets the fundamentals of the legal framework that we deal with. So it enshrines, it's based around this idea that the embryo has a special status. Not in the sense that some religious people give, give the embryo a special status, but you know, they're not re they don't recognise at conception the idea that the embryo is a person. But what it does recognise is the sheer potential of the embryo. You know, unlike skin cells, that clump of cells has the potential to develop into you know, a person, and that person is, is you know, 
respectful of certain kinds of legal protections that don't apply to ordinary cells or tissue or organs. It enshrined into law the idea that you could experiment on human embryos, but only up until 14 days. And in fact, I was talking with Philip earlier, until recently, that was, whatever you think about that 14 day cutoff, that was largely academic because nobody had managed to keep embryos in vitro for anything like that period of time. But in fact, there's a group in Cambridge that got to 13 days recently and you know, abandoned the experiments precisely because they were going to get to 14 days. So you know, clearly there's a sense in what used to be an academic limit is now a very real limit and that may indeed in time become one of those questions about the nature of regulation and innovation. It sets out a whole series of rules which we accept around donation in terms of who can donate and how does consent work, whether you're donating sperm, eggs or embryos. It gives us a framework to use assisted reproduction technologies in terms of inherited serious illnesses like I talked about. And indeed it establishes the whole principle of regulatory oversight. And I think one way of thinking about the HFEA is it's a kind of bargain between science and society. What Parliament said back in 1990 was, you can do this sort of medicine, but only under licence. That's the bargain. In return, you know, in return for my staff going around and poking around in an inspection, you get to do this sort of stuff. You know, with a monopoly provider here, it is a criminal offence to carry out the kind of things in the HFEA Act without a licence from us. That's the bargain. The HFEA itself, as I say, is a statutory regulatory body for IVF and research involving human embryos. Um, it's what's called an arm's length body, sometimes they're all quangos. In other words, it's part of government but somehow independent from government. That suits government well. Uh, it means that if you like that, there's a whole you know, ministers don't then get uh, in the frame, if you like, for individual licensing decisions. It's our responsibility, and yet we're sort of part of this excellent state. Uh, we're governed by a board. Um, currently, it's 14 board members. They're public appointees. You have to apply. Any of you could apply. Um, and crucially, the majority of them have to be lay. In other words, they can't be medics or scientists. And the presumption around that is this idea that, you know, scientists aren't marking other scientists' homework. Effectively. Um, crucially, though, we do need some expertise, because much of what we do is fiercely technical and difficult. And so there's a complicated formula in the act about how many people actually have expertise and how many they have. But, but it's a lay majority is the crucial point. Supported by a permanent executive and civil servants, of which uh, I head. Um, and a lot of what we do is, is set up in a way to encourage transparency. So um, any of you could come to our public meetings. The board meets six times a year. The next one's tomorrow. Um, you can all read the papers that the board considers because they're all online. They went online yesterday. And they remain there, and as do all the minutes. Um, and there's a recording of the meeting should you be sufficiently insomniac. Um, in which you can you can hear us deliberate in public and make decisions in public. And we do that not because we think thousands of people are listening, but because actually we think that's good for trust. We don't think the governance of things like this sort of contested area is best done in private. We think it's best done in public. It's actually part part of the deal. And we also, particularly for particular topics, and one of them I'll talk about later on, we do a lot of work with independent clinicians and scientists, particularly on very specialised areas with, with particular countries' work. Because obviously, we are you know, the same, and sometimes we are talking about things that are world firsts, and we need to know um, really what's, what's going on. And in terms of volume, there's about 120 treatment clinics in the country at the moment, about 20 labs, and 20 projects of work. Um, last year, something like 60,000 patients. So that's the kind of volumes of work that we're going on. So, that's very much scene setting. I want to return to this idea of innovation. And in particular, I want to talk about some work 
um, that was done a few years ago about what are called mitochondrial dementia. Um, some of you may be very well sighted on this. Um, some of you, uh, this may all be very new. So for those who are well sighted, bear with me for the mitochondrial dementia, for dummies bit. And for those who are not, I hope it all makes sense now. So, what is it? Um, in the press, this was called Three Parent Babies. Uh, which is the sort of thing they do with the press. It's kind of snap, it's kind of catchy but misleading. Um, but there we go. So effectively, um, mitochondrial diseases are fairly rare, thankfully. Uh, they tend to be they are passed down through the mother's line. Um, they are usually serious and often fatal. Uh, because of the nature of mitochondria, as those of you know, are the kind of powerhouse, the battery packs of the cell, they tend to affect organs which require lots of energy like heart and brain and lungs and things like that and they result in organ failure and uh, there are many cases of women in the northeast North who I think have lost six or seven children mm -hmm. and have got to the age of ten. You wouldn't want one of these illnesses in your home. And there's a little diagram there showing what happens so uh, if you look at the, the top, there's the mother's egg in this case, and those little red blobs are the diseased or abnormal mitochondria surrounding the nucleus. That's where the problem is. And down the bottom is the donor's egg, and what effectively they do is they take the nucleus out of the donor egg, they nucleate it, they take the nucleus out of the mother's egg and put it into the donor's egg, so it's now surrounded by healthy mitochondria, and then they, through IVF, uh, fertilise the egg with the father's sperm and in theory you then get a biologically related uh, embryo which doesn't have the disease mitochondria. Now clearly because it has somebody else's mitochondria, uh, yeah, you know, I think that's about it's a fraction of a percent of the total amount of the genome, uh, the, the press latched on to this idea of three parent babies. So it's it's two parents and 0, 0.0 something 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 of another parent. Um, so that's the task at hand and uh, this, uh, we are the first country in the world to license it in treatment. And I'll say a little bit about how that went. Well. So there's a rough timeline. Um, this work in the UK at least, it does take place in other parts of the world, it was developed by a group in Newcastle. And back in 2005, we issued them with a research license. And that work looked particularly promising and sufficiently promising that when the Act was changed in 2008, updated in 2008, there was a sort of clever bit of drafting done which allowed for the possibility to then make regulations later on that would allow for these techniques, though they clearly weren't at a state where that was sensible to do. But the government in 2011 then asked us at the HFPA to do a review of safety and efficacy, which we did. They asked us again, in, and we basically said, this looks promising, but not yet. Um, they came back to us in 2013 and said, you, you know, has the science moved on? And we went back to them and said, this looks even more promising, but not yet. Um, in 2014, they asked us then, in the light of that, to start to talk, think about how we can talk to the public about this. It's all very well that the science is going this direction, but what might you know, the public think about this? And alongside that, we did yet another report on safety and efficacy. So there's a period between 2011 and 2014 when this was a big part of our work. And I'll say a little bit more about how we went about that. Um, anyway, that work had sufficiently progressed such that in 2014, the Department of Health did some consultation on draft regulations, and in 2015, Parliament approved those regulations. Uh, about six months later, we managed to turn those regulations into some, into sort of operable regulatory scheme that you could even apply for. Um, and then in uh, 2017, Newcastle were granted a license. They are treating people at the moment. There are no births. Now, what I want to say about all this is. You know, as a long-standing civil servant, this is a remarkably rational uh, and orderly development of public policy. Um, I've been involved in many other bits of public policy, and certainly before I worked for the HEPA, in which 
we did not go through reviews of safety and efficacy and public consultations and all the rest of it. So on this scale, there's an enormous great problem, and we were told to somehow fix it and fix it quickly. Um, so, you know, in one sense, this is, this is a testimony, actually, to a, uh, and particularly when it comes to science and medical matters, a much more rational and ordered way to make policy. Uh, and I have been invited, uh, you know, to, in various bits of government to talk about this, not because people are hugely interested in mitochondrial donation, because what they are hugely interested in is a more rational way to make public policy. So, you know, as, as well as delivering something, um, you know, quite uh, groundbreaking in terms of the, the women who actually have these diseases, it is a, a pointer to a different and slightly more rational way of making public policy. What the law actually allow? Um, the regulations themselves, you can look them up if you're, if you're so inclined, allow, if, if they're really quite particular, they allow for the two techniques. There's one technique called multiple, uh, uh, the terminal spindle technique, another one called pro nuclear transfer, and um, they try and basically achieve the same thing, but crucially, it requires that an embryo, there's a particular risk that the embryo might have these mitochondrial amount abnormalities, and there's a significant risk that the person with the abnormalities will have or develop a serious disease. So it's really quite a precise and actually quite onerous test. What I would say about that is it's a direct mirror of the kind of requirements that are set for PGD, what we call a seriousness test. It's pretty prescriptive. Quite striking, isn't it, that it actually defines the techniques. So if we're thinking about regulation and innovation, if somebody came up with a better technique, that might be unlawful as things stand. It didn't just say any technique for the treatment of mitochondrial disease, it says these techniques for the treatment of mitochondrial disease. So there's a kind of, and I think that goes to the fact that, you know, these are world firsts. And quite naturally, I think when people are considering very early stage development, there is a, a quite natural and understandable tendency to put some pretty rigorous and prescriptive rules around them. And at this very early stage, not only are we licensing clinics, and when I say that, the only clinic licensed company is Newcastle, that's about, you know, do you have the right sorts of staff with the right sorts of competencies? Have you got the right kind of equipment, the right protocols, etc.? So, it's, you know, this is not something that any IVF clinic can do. We also literally licensing individual patients. So Newcastle make an application for us, they have a license to do it, but then they make an application for us for patient A, and we run this seriousness test, and patient B, and so on. So it is very, although we saw, you know, it is a world-breaking uh, development, it is done in very cautious steps at this stage, and it'd be interesting to see over time whether those steps loosen up a bit. So I thought it might be helpful, because if we're thinking about this broader issue, if I said a little bit more about the kind of things that are going on. So, you know, what is it that mitochondrial donation actually throws up for us? There are obvious questions around safety. Quite simply, is it safe? There's a much more sophisticated question to ask over here. Is it safe enough? No world first is safe. And language about safety, you know, A, it's never absolute, but you know, when somebody did the first heart transplant, they didn't know it was safe. They thought it would work, and they thought it was suitably ethical to proceed, but they didn't know it was safe. That's not the test here. We decided the evidence was that it was safe enough that given the harms we're trying to tackle here, it would be ethical to proceed. And that's similar questions arise over efficacy too. In order for something to be efficacious, it doesn't want to work every time, but it does need to work enough times that it would be ethical to proceed. So they're quite sophisticated judgments. Obviously, one of the big issues involved is this germline modification. This change transfers from generation to generation. It's not somatic cell treatments. You know, one of the dangers or the advantages of these treatments take the illness out of the family line, the long-running effects. That means, you know, we need to get it right. There are obvious questions here, though, around reproductive choice. Really quite tricky issues. 
is the right of a woman to have a biologically related child, you know, without bounds? Yeah. There are issues around the welfare of participants themselves. How many times is it reasonable to put somebody through treatment? And there's a sort of broader tricky test here about the, the aggregate societal impact, because we're not just talking about things that bear down on individuals. It's those individuals then play their role in society more generally. So we've gone from Louise Brown to north of 5 million IVF babies. You know, there's an aggregate question to ask as well. Anyway, so how did we start to air some of this with the Great British Public? Um, we did this in quite, a, a, you know, quite an imaginative way at the time, and we won prizes for it. Um, this is tricky stuff. If we did a bit of a box pop out here, Cambridge might be a very bad example given the number of students, but if we normally did a box pop on the street and kind of said to them, what do you understand about mitochondrial donation and the issues of rise, we wouldn't get much of an answer. Not because people are uh, stupid, because why would they know? These are rare diseases. If they're not in the family or friends, you are unlikely to know unless you read about the papers. So there's a very real issue here about, you know, if you're surveying the public about things which actually they haven't come across, you know, you need to engage with them in a rather more imaginative way than simply turning up and saying, you know, this is a good idea, yes or no. Um, and we were interested in things like informed and uninformed views, whether they change over time. We were interested in the distinction between you know, lobbyists or advocates' views and you know, people who weren't, didn't have a particular involvement. So we looked at this a whole bundle of ways. Um, we did a big public representative survey to get a kind of baseline measure of you know, what the public in general think about, for example, IVF in general, uh, altering the embryo at all, all of those kinds of questions. We use groups of people in public workshops. Um, some of you may have read, this is, this is gaining currency more generally in the world. The Irish government did a series of really interesting sort of citizens' juries in order to pave the way for changes in this abortion legislation. So these sorts of techniques have been used in all sorts of ways where you get a group of randomly collected people, they could be as small as 10 or as large as 100. You sit them down for a day, they have reading material, they hear from experts, they talk among themselves. In our case, we did that, we sent them away, and when they came, we did it repeated the exercise, because we interested in how they change their view over time. And one of the things you also see is, as they talk, you see people starting to reach common positions between each other. So in a, if you like, in a sort of opposite of the polarization of the last few years over Brexit, in which either side threw rocks at each other, you actually see people sort of moving towards actually shared or compromised positions. And we did a whole bunch of things with interested audiences in terms of consultation, meetings, we met with patients and the rest of it. And so what does that look like? We had a dedicated website. Um, you can see there, you could find material relating to the subject itself. We had explanatory material. We allowed you to go to public meetings. Uh, we had sections there say what are the issues, which explain both the science and the ethics. Um, and we even structured the website in such a way that you couldn't fill in the consultation without having gone through various material. Because what we didn't want was people just going to it and firing off, you know, six off the cuff answers. We sort of, you know, required you to, to do some pre reading. Um, so, you know, we were making quite a considered effort to actually engage the public in a slightly more imaginative and thoughtful way. Um, we had videos on that website. So this woman, she has lost several children to mitochondrial disease, and we wanted people to kind of hear her story. Because some of this is about making real, you know, what otherwise can seem slightly abstract, all this talk about, you know, mitochondria and cells and, you know, Actually, sometimes people want to work out what does this really mean? And this woman, much more eloquently than I could, spoke about what it was to live with these kind of diseases as a family. So there were videos. And we also had, um, I can't play it here, but um, we had animations in which people talked and sort of, you know, I don't know if you've seen these ones, in which people sort of draw out ideas. 
precisely to try and explain to people you know, what are the processes and what are the issues that arise from them. So we took very seriously and took quite a lot of time in trying to explain what can be difficult and rather sort of um, off-putting technical detail to people before asking the kind of question, well, what do you think? What do they tell us? Actually, on the whole, there was, there was general support for movement in this area. Not, not unqualified. It was most definitely contingent. It was absolutely contingent on safety questions. People, you know, simply wouldn't tolerate the idea, perfectly reasonable. Of, of this just being a slightly sort of flaky experiment. The real question is about safety threshold. The public generally were very moved by the fact that these women had no other treatment options. PPD won't work for them because of the way in which mitochondrial disease expresses. So, you know, it wasn't like, well, they could do this, but there's this new treatment over here. There was something very powerful about them having no other treatment options. And the fact that it happening under strict regulatory control was extremely important to people. They wanted a sense it was being overseen. And one of the things that people did get, and I suppose this shows the extent to which some of this sort of work with different forms of explanation, people got a distinction between, I think in a common sense way, when people think of germline editing or nuclear DNA, what it strikes them about is it goes to the heart of what it is that make up a person. You know, it's, it's not just luck and good diet. Oh, it's my mum and dad that it makes me well over six foot. It's clearly something about my genetic inheritance. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that, you know, that makes me me that's associated with and people got that although you were using another person's mitochondria, and they do contain a, a, a small number of DNA, they were not, these were DNA that were largely associated with the functioning of organs, rather than those things that people thought would make them intrinsically that person. And that was of a different order than nuclear material, and I'll come to that in a minute. And there was a little bit of concern about what ethicists often talk about in terms of slippery slope. So this is this idea that having done one thing, which may seem like quite a good idea, of course you're you know, even more likely to do something else. So, um, you know, the sorts of things that you can imagine might well be, well that's fine. So, you know, where, so where are we in terms of thinking more broadly about people with disabilities? And having done this, are we even more likely to want to take action on these kind of things? So it's commonly cited. You can see where that comes from. But, I mean, taken to extreme, the slippery slope argument suggests that almost no public policy is possible. Because, um, you know, the mere provision of, of state pensions, it was argued at one time or another, would mean that people wouldn't work. So, you know, there's a sort of sense in which all of these things become slippery slopes. And Mary Warnock is famously, although I've never been able to find precisely the quote, um, she said the important thing about slippery slopes is whether you're wearing crampons or skis. Um, and I think that yeah, there is something very profound about there. Um, it doesn't automatically seem to me that having stepped out in a particular policy direction, you always end up at the bottom of the slope. And indeed, one of the things you might want to conclude about the regulation of IVF in this country is the extent to which we have taken positions on a slippery slope and actually stayed there. So, um, I am getting towards the end. Let me jump ahead and say a little bit about genome editing. Um, unlawful in the UK, um, and to the extent there are anywhere with laws at the moment not done in treatment, so there's only one example of being done in China in 2019. Huge, huge news at the time, great concern. There are two big international pieces of work at the moment, one by the WHO and one by another group, looking at whether or not we can agree a set of rules around this in the absence of legislation, 
a lot of concern that um, this might get out of hand in all sorts of ways. So it seems to me worth asking ourselves, what, what you know, so what does mitochondria tell us about how we might think about DNA? So safety and efficacy questions can't be ducked, it seems to me, right? I, they seem to me to be absolutely non-negotiable in the public mind. I think some form of robust regulation before such things become remotely acceptable is a prerequisite. I think it would also be true that the public would absolutely need to see clear benefit. So, for example, when you talk to the public, except for those people who make an absolutely principled objection to any kind of interference with the embryo, people can get relaxed about um, PGD in order to tackle serious diseases in a way that PGD, in order to just simply make you look a bit more attractive with long hair, is viewed as being something trivial and not serious. So there's a clear sense, so there's a lot of nonsense around them about gene editing. It will become a, a race of supermen who are extraordinarily fast and, and uh, um, you know, beautiful and all the rest of it. I, I think you know, the likelihood of public acceptability in anything like the near to medium term over that kind of gene seems to me to be utterly far fetched. Um, but it is worth thinking about, it's unlike mitochondria, gene editing don't you won't find a defined patient group who might benefit from genome editing in a way that those mitochondrial patients do. I find it very difficult at present to imagine diseases that, that um, you can't actually stand a reasonably good chance of fixing with PGD. I think that's a real hurdle for people who want to move to us. But there is a treatment that exists already that is well used, well understood, safe, why adopt something that is new, novel, experimental? What would be the advantages? Would need to be a very real question. There's a real sense, if there is to be a broader move to this, and as I say, these are illegal in this country at the moment, then questions of process and governance really matters. Um, in recent years, the UK courts, through a process of judicial review, have become much more active uh, in terms of looking at the way in which government and state makes decisions. And uh, a number of interventions, those of you might remember, there was some talk quite some years ago now about GM crops. There was a consultation which was taken to court by Greenpeace and others, and the judge found against the government. Now, what the judge, if, you know, the important thing here is the judge is not saying GM crops are bad. The judge is not, if it ever came from them saying genome editing is bad, what the judge is saying is the way in which you, the state, government, went about arguing for those things was flawed. You know, the consultation wasn't a proper consultation, you know, you, you knew what answer you wanted before you started, and so on. So, in any kind of shift like this, and this will be a really significant shift, process and government really matter. And I think there's also a sense, one of the things I reflect on on mitochondrial donation is the extent to which the different sort of political actors play the right roles. So the Department of Health as government remitted to its expert body questions of safety and efficacy. Yeah. The Department of Health isn't equipped to answer those questions. That's no criticism of them. Just as in the end, we never, when we went back to the department, we didn't say, you should do it. We said the evidence suggests that it might be safe for that person. You know, the decision to do it is Parliament, it's politics. We didn't ever advocate for it. We said this is what the evidence suggests. And what strikes me about the whole in mitochondrial debate is the extent to which the different little actors play the right roles. They did politics, we did the expert bit. We didn't sort of muddle the two together. And I think that helps enormously. Right. Let's go on light, jump back to where we started. Which, peculiar enough, is the end. But here we go. Um, what might I draw from all this in terms of thinking about science and innovation and the regulation of it? Because I think there are wider lessons. It seems to me, in many of these kind of areas, to practitioners, a kind of regulatory free-for-all might sound rather attractive. But I know what I'm doing is let me get on with it. 
I'm not so sure that that satisfies the public. And in what is a more populist and sceptical age, and we've all lived through, haven't we, a number of years in which even claiming to be an expert is apparently a dirty word, a simple reliance on my expertise is unlikely to get you very far. So it may well be, in order to create the conditions for innovation in some of these contested areas, uh, regulations are necessary for the but if regulation is actually necessary to encourage innovation, then that needs to be pretty smart regulation. One of the growths of the regulatory state in recent years has been the growth of what we would call an audit culture, in which effectively, in a sort of tick box, tick box rather uninspiring way, people are just checking the checkers. So if somebody comes in and audits something, and then somebody says, well, what do you think about the quality of the audit? And then they audit the audit. And you can see where this is going ad finitum. Um, that's not smart, intelligent regulation. It's just the imposition of a sort of dull, unthinking audit culture on uh, what are quite fast-moving innovative things. So it does seem to me that if we move away from that model, then regulation actually can create what I call a protective space where innovation can flourish. So that's my American scientists avoiding placards and guns in return for rules. Some kind of protective space. But I think a big part of actually that is around transparency. Um, commercial confidentiality at times can make these things kind of difficult. You can see, can't you, in some of the worries at the moment around artificial intelligence. Um, the big question is unlocking some of those algorithms and shining light on them, when actually this is where a lot of the commercial value is, in such a way we don't understand what these algorithms and decision-making tools are actually doing. But without finding some kind of balance between intellectual property and transparency, I fear establishing a kind of credible regulatory regime is going to be difficult. Um, we do, I think, if we are to continue to successfully uh, cope with innovation, need a rather more sophisticated understanding of risk and benefit. The more these are couched in absolutes, the harder it will be to have these kind of necessary conversations because we are very rarely dealing with things like it is safe, don't worry. A much more sophisticated understanding, given the potential benefits, given what we know so far, it would be ethical to proceed in these kind of circumstances with this kind of oversight is a very different conversation from, is it safe? It isn't really. If that's the test we're looking for, we're unlikely to innovate very well. Which brings me back to where I started. It seems to me could be better is some kind of sophisticated rules in a way that generates trust can create the conditions. Excellent talk. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for Q and A as well. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? Um, I was wondering about how you decide um, on the board membership of the team, because um, we seem to need lay people, but we also need expertise. And how do you decide who should be on the board? Good question. So, it's a public appointments process managed by the cabinet office. Um, our chair sits on the interview panel, um, but in the end these are ministerial decisions based on recommendations. There are criteria, so we can go looking for particular people with particular expertise, but yeah, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a public appointments process. So anybody can apply? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah if you fit the criteria. Um, yeah, and sometimes we particularly want, um, so for example, we might want somebody who's got particular experience in, I think it was the lay roles. Uh, we've um, at various points had people with a religious background, we've had moral philosophers, we've had legal experts, we've had people who've got experience of working with patients, you know, there's a whole range of things, you know, we can, we can sort of slightly specify, but, and I think the trick is ever is to try and get a decent mix of skills, because with most boards, what you're trying to do, ideally boards, you know, you're trying to avoid a kind of groupthink mentality, where there is, you know, the board is not at war with itself, but at the same time, there's a proper exchange of different mm -hmm. sorts of views. 
Hi, um, I'm particularly interested in mitochondrial donation and the way you've regulated it. And one area that I find especially interesting is the way that you've regulated information disclosure to donor conceived individuals. That's right. So my understanding of it is that as a as someone who has been conceived through MRT, yeah. they, those people are able to receive information, like, well, they're able to apply for information on whether they were conceived in that manner yeah. and then to receive non-identifying information on the donor. So can yeah. you comment a bit on what was the rationale behind giving this sort of limited right to information to those individuals? Because it relates to this idea that, that the mitochondria themselves are playing a really small part. So clearly, in normal circumstances, if, if you're born of, you know, your, your father, the one you see sperm, and a donated egg from another woman, she's supplying half the DNA. The mitochondrial donor is providing a very, very tiny selection of the DNA. And the view, certainly, that the government took at the time, therefore, the, the sort of, if you like, the emotional connection was much more akin to a blood donor or an organ donor rather than whether you're donating sperm or eggs. So that's, that's the distinction. It's trying to sort of suggest that um, it's a different kind of donation. That's interesting to me just because it seems to be like an in-between um, organ donation and, and regular gamete donation. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a fair point. It is a, it is, it is a, it is a sort of curious half thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, whether that's the right answer is another question, but that's where you're trying, as I say, to, you know, you're trying to put a legal framework where something that nobody's done before. Mm -hmm. I guess it's easier to to start on a more cautious approach yes. it, because it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, and that's the other thing. So we, many, many years ago, well before I was in this job, P PGD patients were also approved individually rather than at a disease level. Now, it's partly because we've got very used to PGD, but it's also actually now on the basis of the volume. So we just don't, you know, we couldn't even administratively do that, it wouldn't be sensible. But we're also much more confident about it. And one of the open questions will be, although of course the numbers of people with mitochondrial disease is mercifully pretty low, is whether or not actually, once these become genuinely proven techniques and treatment, actually some of the prescriptive nature of the regulatory regime is recast. Because, yeah, exactly. It's no longer new, it's no longer as, um, I want to get the word experimental. Hi, um, I was just wondering, when you're making decisions, how do you kind of weigh up the, um, if like the public has very different views of the expert, like yeah. if the expert fundamentally just disagrees with like something that's come out of the public, what kind of weight do you give to like the public versus the expert in this decision making? It, it's not subject to a, a neat arithmetical algorithm or anything like that. So what we don't do is merely count the public and say, oh, 51% of people thought this, therefore we'll do it or we won't do it. Um, we use it much more as a way of trying to understand where the public is. Now clearly, if the numbers were 99% one way and 1% the other, that would be different. But, um, so it's not a plebiscite. It is much more to inform the decision, and the authority is in no, uh, it doesn't have to follow that kind of consultation that it does. It does it to inform the decisions, and then the question is, you know, and you can see this in, in, in the sort of public discussion the authority has, in the light of that kind of evidence around public opinion, you know, how do we weigh it, and why do we either go with it or, or not? But I think that's a long winded way of saying it, it's very much a sort of case-by-case -case judgmental approach rather than just, you know, we've now crossed the threshold, we couldn't possibly do it. Because um, um, let's imagine there was a new treatment that might look an extraordinarily beneficial. We thought the risks were manageable, but the public just didn't much like the idea of it. Well, you're denying treatment options to people who might be very ill, and the fact that the public might be a bit queasy about it, it might not necessarily be an an ethical reason not to do it with certain kind of conditions around it. So it, it, it's there, it's, it, it's not formulaic. Um, this is a bit of a bit, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, a, a bit of a different point. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how transferable you think this kind of effort is. 
I mean, I, I'm thinking that there's beginning to be a call, and it probably will, um, it'll grow for regulation of machine learning, mm -hmm. AI, the training data that's used, mm -hmm. etc. Would a, a do you think that a regulatory system a bit like the one you're using would be the better way to do that? That's a really good question, and there is some, there's some discussion in government precisely about that. In fact, there's a new regulatory sort of advisory body set up, and part of that question is exactly that. You know, should it be an advisory body or should it have licensing teams? I think, that, I think AI is more complicated than machine learning because actually it's... What's, what's relatively straightforward about IVF is it, it's a fairly contained sector. The problem with machine learning is applications might be all over the place. So we've got machine learning in criminal justice, to inform criminal justice decisions. We've got machine learning in the um, you know, financial products. We've got machine learning in data protection fields and so on. So the thought that the moment with this new advisory body is that it then works with the Information Commission Office, the financial regulators, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is some interest in that, and in particular interest, I think, about the arm's length nature, the idea of a late majority, the idea of the transparency, and so on. So it is, I, I, and because all this is very new, I think people are sort of, government is trying to find its way on this one, but you're, but you're right. But the, the public face of this at the moment is facial recognition and yes, the, exactly. the inequality with which it recognises different facial Precisely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Different groups. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and in various parts of the world there's really quite disturbing examples of the way it's informed uh, criminal justice decisions, which appear to just replicate our prejudices as well as anything else. So it's a lady just a bit dumb. Uh, I don't know if you have any concerns about the commercialisation of egg freezing in young healthy women. Uh, pressure from businesses to freeze their eggs who are being paid for egg freezing to defer their pregnancy rate. Are there risks involved in that? And what, is there, what do you see as any, anything that you should have an overview on? Ye yes. Um, and we have, a, we have some rules around this, around informed consent and all the rest of it. You, you're, and there have been examples, for example, where people have tried to import as well, um, frozen embryos often from um, countries like the Ukraine, where young women. So yes, I mean, I think it is. I think the crucial question here is, I think it's quite difficult to simply put a, a sort of cut-off line on it. The issue here is about the nature of informed consent. Um, I think there are issues around the extent to which any recompense is. Um, if you like, compensation for the gift involved and indeed the procedure and at what point that tips over into something that might incentivise behaviour and um, although we can't regulate companies I am, it's interesting when I talk to some of the female staff at work so some companies have started to market these sorts of schemes some of the tech companies in America and uh, w one young woman said to me, I'd just much rather they have better policies in terms of allowing people to have time off work and not delay their career rather than a kind of technical fix in which, you know, you work all the hours that God sent, but don't worry, we'll pay for you to freeze your eggs. And I think there is a danger in which um, an economic system, which at times just does, still has yet to really um, adapt to the idea that you know, how do we square off the need for women to have meaningful careers and yet also have families? Is being sort of, instead of fixing that problem, there's a sort of technical fix being offered. So I think there are, that much more of an American phenomenon than over here. But yeah, we, we're, we're, we're keeping quite a close eye on that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Interesting discussion. And it's going to have another round of applause. We're hanging out for about maybe five more minutes if you want to ask them.